Good. So as we get started, I want to start by acknowledging that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I know some of you will live in different uh, unceded traditional territories. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a trip to Nice in the south of France that we did a year, about a year ago. I did this trip at the end of a cruise down the Rhone River where we ended here in Avignon and we saw um, this Rhone cruise with uh, uh, Don and Lorna Blake at a previous session and at the end of the trip in Avignon, this is uh, in the morning in Avignon and the famous so-called Pont d'Avignon we went from Avignon up here to Nice and rather than just take the bus to Nice and go with the ship's bus we decided to take private transportation and go from Avignon to Aix-en-Provence stop there for an hour and a half and then go on to Nice so that's what we did to get to Nice and this allowed us a little break to visit uh, Aix-en-Provence and here is the uh, square of the fountains for obvious reasons. Their cathedral, which is not very exciting, but this is along their main tourist street. But there are lots of little squares with markets and it's quite a pleasant place for a stop en route. Um, and uh, I, I love markets and lots of color, as you can see here. And this young lady was quite happy to have me take a photograph Clearly, she's looking at me and allowing me to photograph her. And um, other things to see in the market, these two dogs were keeping their own company, had a blanket set out for them next to all the fruit and vegetables. And we like to uh, have a break and just have a coffee in one of the squares. So this is the square that we had coffee in, Edie, my wife and I at the top. Um, my traveling companions, my brother and his wife below. And we sat having some coffee and looking at the view at the right hand side, with lots of activity going on. And uh, then we carried on to Nice. And like many places, they have these hashtags, I love Nice, right on the uh, main uh, walkway by the water. The, this is Nice and this is the Promenade des Anglais. The Promenade des Anglais is this area here that you can walk just along the side of the road and it carries on for about seven kilometers and it was built by the British in the 18th century and at the time this was considered a fashionable thing to do to go for walks along the water and a lot of British came to Nice including Queen Victoria and um, they decided that they would like to have a place to go for a stroll so they built this little promenade which still exists today the bay itself is called the bay des anges the bay of angels and here is the beach that you see lots of people on the beach and people are swimming it's an awful beach um, it's rocky it's quite unpleasant to walk on with your bare feet and until you can get some buoyancy from the water, it's uncomfortable to walk into the water too, regardless of how cold or warm it might be. But it's a beach and many people are there. And you can see all the people on the promenade here. Well, we went to Nice May the 23rd to May the 29th. And I didn't know in advance but there was a con film festival from May the 16th to 27th with the Palme d'Or being awarded on May the 27th. That's when we were there. The Monaco Grand Prix, which I had absolutely no interest in seeing or hearing, was on May the 26th to May the 28th. And what it did for us, unfortunately, was increase the uh, prices of the hotels dramatically and made it very difficult to find a place to stay even well in advance. So we stayed at this hotel, the Mercure Nice, by the Promenade des Anglais. 
And you will see that for the last, for three nights of the Monaco Grand Prix, the price doubled from 397 to over $800 a night. So one of the things I can say is that if you're going to place, uh, you're not quite sure about all the different festivals, you might want to check it out in advance because you may or may not choose to go there. If you're interested in the Grand Prix, this was a brilliant time to visit. If you wanted to go to the uh, Cannes Film Festival, a brilliant time to visit. If you weren't interested in those things, it was not the best time to visit uh, because there were lots more people around and prices were higher. Anyhow, we survived, we did manage to get a place to stay. So our hotel was located right in this area, close to the Hard Rock Cafe, right on the corner across from the beach. So right on the Promenade des Anglais. And I want to show you that there's this green area here and it has path through it. And it's called the Promenade Payon. And we did a lot of walking along this trail here. On the left hand side, very soon after it's Place Massena, one of the main squares, which is a hub. And then on the right hand side is the old part of Nice. And over here is a hill where the chateau and the colline, the hill of the chateau. And if you go up to the top of the hill, you can look over to the other side at the port of Nice. So we were very well situated to go walking around. And if we walked along Promenade Payon, we came to this sculpture very quickly. It's a huge sculpture and it's called the Arc de 115.5. This sculpture is exactly the same shape as the Bay des Ones, that Nice is on. And that's what it represents. The bay itself has that particular shape and curve. There are lots of plants and the yucca was in bloom. I liked it, I liked the blue sky. And we reached Place Massena. And Place Massena, as I said, is a hub because right here, there is a light rail system that will take you a, a tram, uh, part of their uh, bus system, which we used. And at night, this uh, square is lit up with very interesting kind of lit sculptures on these posts, as you can see here, different colors. Um, this building here is Galerie Lafayette. So it's a big shopping area, lots of restaurants, some hotels. And across from the place itself on the other side is this sculpture called the Fountain of the Sun, the Fontaine du Soleil, as you can see here. And as we carry on, east toward the Colleen, um, from uh, along P Promenade Payon, we pass a water park. Lots of kids were fooling around in the park after the water went off. And then there's a regular playground for kids with a lot of elaborate uh, things for them to play on and slide, as you can see here. On the right hand side of the picture on the bottom, is the old part of Nice where you can see this uh, clock tower and toward the end of the promenade Payon is a replica of David Michel Michelangelo or da uh, Michelangelo David I should say and we saw this at the time that uh, in America there was all this uh, issue about uh, whether these things were acceptable to show at all in uh, schools so, uh, having any nude figure and we thought well what would the Americans have to say about this in a public park with children running around you know if we then crossed over from here from the promenade Payon into the old here called Old Nice and we'll visit uh, the Marche, the Market aux Fleurs and the Cour Salaya and then we'll carry on up toward the Colline the Hill so this is uh, the flower market. It's got a lot more than flowers. It's one small area that's mainly flowers and then there's lots of uh, other things being sold here. You can buy soaps and different artifacts and fruit and vegetables and there are markets around. Uh, some of the uh, tomatoes here, just beautiful heirloom tomatoes. 
And one of the things that is famous in uh, Nice is a meal of food called soca. And this is soca. And soca is a chickpea flatbread. It's something that the laborers typically used to eat in the morning uh, for breakfast. It was hearty, it was filling, it was cheap. Uh, we had to sample it, of course, and I uh, never had it before. And my brother is waiting to get a, a wedge of soccer from this is one of the more famous soccer places in the, the market area. Um, there are four of us, none of us particularly liked the dish. We eventually gave, uh, there came three little pieces or bit, relatively big pieces. We gave a uh, couple of pieces away to uh, three uh, young men who thought, well, they'd eat anything. They were not impressed either, but maybe some people would like it. It's some, worth a taste, it's cheap, so it's okay. Then strolling around the old uh, uh, city of Nice. One of the clock towers is more than one. The streets are uh, relatively narrow, painted, and you look at this and you might say, well, this looks a lot uh, like you could be in Italy. And indeed, um, up here, if I can move this, you can see there's a sign that's the Rue de l'Ancien Senat, but also a sign in, it in Italian, Carriera dei Prisons, totally different. And it's interesting to talk about the history of Nice and why it's so much Italian. But at one time, um, Nice was part of one of the Italian states, city states. And Nice itself is here. And it was part of the Duchy of Savoy, which included Turin. Came down all the way from Turin, from the mountains in Turin, all the way to the south to Nice, bypassing Monaco which was part of the Republic of Genoa. There were different duchies and republics in Italy at the time. This was in 1494 map. And 300 years later, here's a different map, same area. Nice is still part of Italy, but now part of the Kingdom of Sardinia, which is what ruled Turin and Asti and also Sardinia. And then Italy was unified in 1861 as Italy and without all of these republics and kingdoms and so on. And uh, as part of the unification process, the French supported Garibaldi and his troops and supported the attempt to unify Italy. And in return, the Italians gave France Nice. So Nice became French. And that was in 1861. So there's a lot of old Italian architecture in Nice. And of course, Garibaldi was a very important figure here. And uh, there is a class Garibaldi in the old city, which is here, early in the morning before too many people are around. It's Garibaldi's statue on top. One of the churches in the old city, um, it's often called Eglise de Jesus, it, uh, the Church of Jesus, but the real name is Eglise Saint Jacques de la Majeure. And it's very beautiful inside, as you can see, very elaborate. Another uh, clock tower. And interesting windows. And now I'm going to take a stroll from here and go up the hill, which is relatively steep. And we have some narrow pathways, like this one, the resta Indian restaurant on the left hand side with all the decorations. And now we're going up this street and I'm looking backwards and we're looking toward the mountains, the foothills of the Maritime Alps. And we pass this uh, enterprising person structure called the Invisible Man. And if you want to take a photo, he would like you to leave 50 cents. Um, he's nobody there. But you can leave money if you choose to, if you want to take a photograph. I thought that's a rather enterprising individual. And now I've got to the top of the hill on this side and we can look back down on the uh, rooftops of Old Nice and the mountains in the background. The tower uh, with a clock on it is Tour Saint Francois, Saint Francis's Tower. And at the top of the hill, uh, next to the chateau, 
is a very big cemetery which has very elaborate headstones and vaults as you can see here. And next to this Catholic cemetery, which is huge, is a much smaller Jewish cemetery just next to it. We could not get into the Jewish cemetery on this occasion because it was on a Saturday morning that we visited and that's the Sabbath and it was closed. But just outside it, something that was just put up recently in 2018 is uh, this uh, um, memorial to talk about the Jews that were deported from Nice to the death camps. And this was part of the roundup of Jews in mid-July 1942. If you heard me talk about uh, Paris before, I talked a bit about this, the same roundup in Paris on July 16th and 17th, where people were put in this velodrome uh, of Dive, Valdiv. It's part of the same time that they were rounding up all the Jews. And this, this is there to re remember that. And this was done by, sorry, by the uh, um, Vichy government, not by the Germans. And this memorial next to it lists the names of all the Jewish uh, people who were uh, alphabetically, who were deported and died. And this is the Jewish cemetery, which I visited about 20 years previously. Um, rather elaborate headstones for Jewish cemetery and I'm Jewish and so different from what I was accustomed to some of them not in good repair as you can see from the top of the hill you go to the other side you look over into the port of Nice and on this trip we're looking down into the port and there is this huge yacht Turns out this is one of the Russian oligarchs yacht has been impounded because of the sanctions that were put in place with the uh, um, war in Ukraine. And I could then go down the hill and walk along the water and end up on the other side. And if you look back then from the other side, along the fishing boat here, you can see the hill that I took the previous photograph down. And you can see this big yacht rather out of place here. And if we go back one picture, you can see uh, a naval ship here, Coast Guard ship, um, protecting this area. There is, uh, along this walkway from the port, there's this memorial to fallen soldiers. And it really is rep to do with the war of 1914 to 1918, which I gather from a number of French guides is the more important war as far as the French were concerned. This is the war that they felt was the Great War. They really gave up uh, very early on in the Second World War, as many of you will know. So we went one day and took a cab and just went from Nice here to end up at Cap Ferrat and visit Villefranche-sur-Mer and Villa Efflussi de Rochefield. We started off with Villa Efrusi. And here we are at the villa in the garden, Efrusi de Rothschild. Me, Edie, my brother and his wife, um, Cap Frat looking over the water. And some things about this, because it's quite an interesting place. It was built in 1905 to 1912 by Beatrice Efrusi de Rothschild. And this lady was a rather unfortunate lady. At 19, she was married to Maurice Efrusi son of a Russian trader and banker. He was a playboy. He raced horses, he gambled heavily. Beatrice contracted venereal disease from Maurice and was unable to bear children of her own. In 1904, finally, with Maurice having gambling debts of over 12 million gold francs, the Rothschilds took him to court and Beatrice divorced Maurice. Fortunately, just in time, because her father died the year after, and she inherited this immense fortune, which she no longer had to share with Maurice. And with this fortune, one of the things she did was to build this villa, and it's accompanied by nine different gardens. This is part of the French formal garden. And inside, you can do an audio tour, which we did, 
and it's quite spectacular inside with beautiful views uh, of the water. And I want to point out in this room sculptures of, of two dogs. This lady loved her dogs, loved them so much that she had in 1896 a dog wedding at the home of Monsieur and Madame Efrusi. She had a place in uh, the Bois de Boulogne in Paris and so she had this wedding for her dog in Paris and here is uh, from um, the Morning Times, a Washington DC newspaper. Madame Efrusi sent out formally engraved invitations to several hundred of her friends announcing the approaching nuptials of Diane, her favorite poodle, and La Petite Major, a handsome poodle owned by her father. Not only were the recipients of these invitations asked to come themselves, but requested to bring their dogs along. The humans and their dogs turned out in full evening dress. The bride, Diane, who is described as a poodle of rare grace and beauty, wore a white satin dress trimmed with beautiful lace, a long tulle veil decorated with orange blossoms and white kid shoes. Major, the bridegroom, wore full evening dress, swallowtail coat, vest, trousers, not creased because it is not fashionable to crease the trousers at weddings, patent leather shoes and gloves. On the buttonhole of Monsieur Major's coat was a dainty or dainty orchid. So, so much for this what went on in that, those times. Looking from the villa along the French garden, you can see the outline of it, formal gardens. There are many, there are eight other gardens and different things that you will find, some exotic gardens, cacti and so on, ficus tree, big rose garden, and from the rose garden you're looking at the rest of Cap Ferrat on the left hand side and the Bay of Villefranche to the right. So after our visit there, we decided we were going to walk from here, Villa Fursi, along the water and the hill to reach Villefranche sur Mer. And we, our destination was a restaurant for lunch called Lou Bantry. I think Richard, uh, who's on this call, recommended this restaurant once to another member of our group, um, to uh, Lorna and Don Blake, and they recommended it to me. So that's where we were headed for lunch. It took about an hour to walk there, but beautiful views. And here we're looking down to the Bay of Villefranche toward the beach that we're heading to. We're actually heading over to this area here, this beach. Um, before that, and this is the restaurant Lou Bantry. We were able to get tables to sit just on the water. This is the Plage de Marinière en route to uh, the main town. And in the main town after lunch, we went strolling and it's again got beautiful narrow streets, nice colored buildings, interesting windows, doors. And the very old part of this uh, Villefranche de Mer has almost like tunnels that you walk through. It's uh, rather creepy, lit by la these kind of uh, lantern-like structures. And there's a fort, an old fort from 1557 that we visited. And inside the uh, fort, One of the rooftops and tiles to bell, and then some trees with flowers and seeds, like the castor bean tree here and popcorn cassia on the left. Okay, so we got back to Nice, and uh, another day we took a train and we went from Nice by train to Antibes. And Antibes has the biggest uh, yacht collection in the port of all of the towns on the, in the Riviera. And this is part of the yacht collection, the marina. The central part of Antibes, restaurant here where we had lunch, just outside the square. And it's quite a place that artists come and they paint, as this lady was doing. 
the market? Can you have a covered market? Under the museum, a Picasso museum, with a number of interesting uh, paintings by Picasso. And then next to the railway station, I was waiting for the train to come back. There was a, a little park, so we hung out there and there was this uh, a stone pine, also known as the umbrella pine, which I thought the uh, bark was quite interesting. It's uh, photographed here. And they even had a bird of paradise plant in, in this uh, little park. I guess it's tropical enough for that. So we did a private tour that we arranged through tours by locals uh, to visit the mountains in, in this area, Valbon, Gourdon, Tourette, sur loup going up into the mountains. And we did another tour two days later with the same person to go east toward Italy. And I should mention that um, the lady who took us around told us that uh, if I was able to find her without going through tours by locals, I would have saved about 30%, which is what uh, she has to pay tours by locals for posting uh, herself on their website. In any case, this lady took us around to Balboa first. Her name is Ingrid Mucker. And if you can find her online, it, she is a wonderful tour guide. And she has this Mercedes vehicle that will easily hold four people and probably a couple more, although a bit more cramped. And she is very good at picking out the spots to visit on the right days. So Friday was the day we, she had suggested we went with her and she wanted us to go to Valbon to the Friday market day. And everywhere there were things being sold with some clothes, jewelry, whatever, and fruit and vegetables and wine. And here's one of the restaurants waiting. We were there before lunch, we're early in the morning. Some of the interesting uh, cafe here. Again, very interesting windows. Outside one of the houses. Another plant that I like, the flower, it's the scarlet kunzia. And we had uh, our coffee sitting here in this uh, little square at this cafe in the middle of the marketplace. And after we had coffee, we went to these people and we started to buy vegetables and things that we could eat for lunch. And we bought some saucisson, olives and cheeses and so on, a bottle of wine, rosé, and we were off, uh, put these in the vehicle, and we were then off into the mountains from Valbon, into the mountains to visit Gourdon. And here we're on route to Gourdon, it's perched on top of this cliff. And here we are with the Gourdon in the background. And Ingrid, brought in her car folded up a picnic table which she unfolded put up tablecloth plates everything she brought three baguettes which you can see up here and we laid it all out and that's what we had for our lunch sitting up at the top of this mountain in this little park with no one else there but us and there we are all ready to dig into our lunch that we just bought in the market in Valbon, except for the bread that she had brought from Nice. And then we went to visit the little village of Gourdon. Nice place to stroll around. And then from there we went to the old village of Tourette sur Loup. And this is Tourette on the Loup. Loup is a river. The river loop goes through the mountains here, starting here and going down past Tourette sur Loup to end up in the Bay des Anges, close to Antibes actually. And it's only 49 kilometers long, so it's a pretty small river. And again, very quaint town or village, I should say, art galleries. Planters everywhere. 
very photogenic and lots of valerian growing on the top of the um, hills and we're looking down into the valley and this valerian they use it for a variety of things insomnia anxiety depression premenstrual syndrome menopause symptoms and even headaches but the town is famous for violets a violet production has been the village's main agricultural activity since 1880 and they grow only one variety of violets and it's a Victoria uh, variety. This lady uh, was happy to let me take a photograph. I was really interested in her sewing machine. So beautifully decorated and she was she had a little shop and she made clothes and she was selling them there and using this machine to to make her garments. Oh and Close to the parking area, a few old people were playing bull. It's a bit like bocce in Italy. And they throw these balls around to hit things. Um, a lot of concentration. This guy is concentrating and he's just about to throw his ball. And I don't think he liked how he threw his ball. Okay. The next trip we did with... Uh, um, was, well, was Ingrid. Ingrid was to go along the coast from Nice in the other to Ev. We bypassed Monaco because of the Grand Prix. We went to uh, up to Dolce Acqua in Italy and then back to finish off in Menton. So as we started out very early in the morning uh, we went to a hill overlooking Villefranche Bay to one side, uh, which we see here. And on the other side, we're looking back at Nice. So you can pick out some of the structures in Nice from previously. This is the Colleen, the hill. This is the port with the Russian oligarch yacht here. And we're on the other side of the city of uh, Nice. And we visited the town of Ez. Ez actually has a part on the sea, which is not as interesting as the part up on the hill, which is where we were. The, the uh, railway station is down by the sea. And because we left early in the morning, right after an early breakfast, we were the only tourist in Ez. And Ez right now has a population of about eight people. And the rest of it is uh, hotels, like this Chateau de Chevre d'Or, there's all been all the previous private houses have been bought up, but but a few. And apart from people who are staying in the hotels, there are none of the usual day tourists here yet. So we're able to go into the Chateau de Chevre d'Or. And from this two-star Michelin restaurant, which we normally wouldn't be allowed in, we were allowed in. And we could sit there and look at the view that people having breakfast and dinner would have from that restaurant. This is Cap Ferrat. This is where the Villa Efruzzi de Rothschild would be. This is the Bay of Villefranche. And this is what we're looking at here, down from Edge. And we strolled around the little streets of Edge, water fountains. And this is a, the Passage de Sarrazine. This place had been invaded repeatedly by the Moors, by the Saracens, and this was called the door of uh, the Moors, the Moors door, uh, where they would come up from the water, from the sea, and climb all the way up here to sack the, the, the city, or the town. And this is the view from higher up in Edge, and we went up to these gardens that are called their exotic gardens, and they're really like cacti type gardens that we're uh, going to visit and many different types of cacti, lots of flowers and bloom. Here's another type of prickly pear cactus. Some things that are weird and wonderful. And then this church a little bit below. And now you can see in the parking area down at the bottom, we have a couple of tour buses. As we were going down, the tour buses were arriving. So if you can, get there before the tour buses. And by the time we got back down, they were preparing lunches for the tourists. And this is paella, 
paella being prepared there. I'm not sure why they're having Spanish type of paella, but that's what they're having with seafood paella. We didn't have any. It was too early still for us. We headed on instead from as past Monaco to Dolce Aqua. This is as close to Monaco as I got on this trip. Up in the hills, we looked down on Monaco and said bye bye. Here from a previous trip to Monaco, when it was not Grand Prix time, this is the marina at Monaco with all the fancy yachts. Instead, we headed on, I said, to Dolce Aqua. This is a very little town in the hills uh, in Italy with this little uh, castle on the top, this bridge. And it's in part famous because it was painted by Claude Monet. And they have this frame here and said, this is where Claude Monet would have sat to paint this painting of the tower here, the bridge, put a couple of people on it, another person here. This is his painting. So we got to stay where Monet uh, was to take, do this painting. And then we uh, again were treated to a market, different type of market, have lots of honey in this uh, place. And here are the main square selling clothes and different things. And then we go from the main square, we went up into this narrow area here, going up toward the tower. And you can see that the streets are rather narrow. We go up. We pass these people hanging out, having a drink. This would have been about 11 or so in the morning. Again, interesting streets. And this is where we stopped to have an Italian lunch uh, with uh, the tower and the town of Dolce Acqua in the background. And then we came back down to Mont Menton, which is back into France. Here's the bay, Mont Menton. The town itself has beautiful yellow orangey colors. This is their Basilica Saint Michel, which figures prominently in many uh, of the art things in uh, Monto. Monto. The the uh, patterns on on the uh, ground I thought were quite interesting. Also, you can see them here. Some of the nooks and crannies along the streets. Sign pointing toward an artist's uh, studio. Windows, flower plants, the uh, rooftops. And we're back to Nice. And here's the tram at Place Massena. You can see Gallery Lafayette to the left. I'm back to uh, this um, sculpture that we had shown you before. And so now we took another day to visit some museums. There are two major museums there, the Matisse Museum, which was closed when we were there this time. Uh, outside the Matisse Museum, there are some Roman ruins. And this area is called Simiez, C-I-M-I-E-Z. And this is where there was a Roman town. There's a Roman, old Roman arena that we didn't visit. Um, but this is part of the Roman ruins. They're not fantastic Roman ruins. They're better elsewhere. So we didn't visit the Matisse Museum inside this time. But we did visit the Chagall Museum. And Chagall designed this museum himself. And he created uh, art specifically to go into this museum. Outside the museum, when you go in and you're now outside, the, the main uh, structure, there's this pond with this big mosaic. And apparently he didn't actually go and do the work, but he designed it and he directed the workers into how the mosaic was to be done. And this is what has come out. Inside, in this big room, he created a series of 10 paintings 
that represent the biblical message and they're all huge paintings and you can see here one of the paintings that clearly demonstrates Adam and Eve about Eve about to eat the apple in the Garden of Eden and they're being kicked out of Eden here's Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac and then Moses collecting the Ten Commandments so a lot of biblical stories in this room ten, ten, ten different uh, large paintings but one of the highlights in the area apart from the art is this auditorium and they were celebrating 50 years uh, of this museum and in this auditorium when we arrived they had a, a video presentation on the screen the video presentation finished and everybody who's in the room and there were only about 12 people there I would think they walked out and so we were left by ourselves and we sat in this room and this music uh, started to play and there was nobody else, nothing, no noise, just this music and this, in this auditorium there are stained glass windows that have been created by Chagall and these stained glass windows represent um, the cre creation the first four days on the right the next two days and the final day the seven days of creation the piano on the stage the inside is painted by Chagall here bigger is the uh, the windows that you can see better stained glass windows it was quite an extraordinary experience. We were very lucky to be able to sit there and just for the next 25 minutes listen to this music that was created specifically for this concert hall by Ilya Osokin. As it says, it invites us to live a sensory and immersive experience in dialogue with the three stained glass windows of Chagall's creation of the world. And they have this quadraphonic song specialization device and music is throughout the, the uh, auditorium space. Well, to finish off our trip, we splurged one night and went to uh, the Chanticleer, a fancy restaurant at the Hotel Le Negresco. And I really wanted to go there because about 20 years previously when I was in Nice, this was what this was the first Michelin starred restaurant that I had ever been to. And I went with Edie and we had an extraordinary experience so we wanted to try and check it out again. So one of the things that uh, apart from the fact this is the table that we're at, all very fancy, very nice. But they allow you, if you're a visitor coming to the restaurant, to tour the public areas of the Hotel Negresco. And here we are in one of the main foyer of this hotel, which is quite spectacular. And this is what it looks like with paintings everywhere and just beautiful. Another room in the main area. And finally, after dinner, we walked back to our hotel, which is just a 10 minute walk along the uh, Promenade des Anglais. And this is the hotel that you can see in Negresco, which is where we had dinner. And a final visit to uh, Place Massena at night. So thank you very much. That was our trip to Nice and the vicinity. And I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. I'm going to Try to stop sharing now. Stop sharing. And I, I don't know. I want to view gallery. Okay. Thank you. And uh, any questions or comments from anyone? I'm sure many of you have been to Nice or this area and have something to say about your experiences. No.
I know Richard must have been there because Richard, I gather that you were the person who recommended Lou Bantry as a restaurant for in Villefranche to Mer for Don to go to. Is that true? Yeah, if I may, I see Paul has his hand up, but uh, let me respond oh. briefly. Yes, I actually was interested in going to the Monaco Grand Prix. I've never been to a Grand Prix, and I'm not planning to go to another one. And I follow a correspondent who um, who always uh, stayed in Villefranche-sur-Mer and took the train to uh, to attend the event because it, the prices do not go up in Villefranche to anything like the extent that they do in Nice. The only drawback to it, we had a very pleasant time there. The beach, by the way, is sandy, not rocky. And um, we had a very pleasant time. The only real issue was that the train, which is frequent and fast between Villefranche, I guess Nice, we didn't go that way, and, and Monaco, was absolutely jammed, even at seven in the morning. Uh, you kind of were looking around for the pushes that would have been in a Japanese subway to get extra people into the cars. But other than that, it was a very pleasant experience, and, and we did most of the things that you did in terms of airs and Montaigne and so on, and uh, and then went on to Italy. But uh, Don Blake has also stayed there, as you mentioned, and I think we would both recommend for consideration for anyone who wants to stay in that part of, the, of France. So many of your photographs uh, really resonated and brought back very good memories, so thank you. You're welcome. Paul Harrison, you had your hand up. I, I echo Richard's comments. It's lovely to see places I've been from a different person's visit perspective. We stayed in Nice, just off the Place Massena, and we took the buses and the trains up and down, down to Cannes and up as far as Monton, um, uh, and found them, it wasn't Grand Prix time. <laughs> we, we found um, them both quite uh, useful. Uh, to get to the smaller places. Um, our daughter was working at the time at, at NATO in Brussels and she flew down for the weekend with us and she was determined to swim in the Mediterranean. <laughs> so we did experience that rocky beach at, at Nice. <laughs> um, I, I dipped my toes in, but she went for a full swim. Uh, but thank you. It, it was lovely to see those photos. Helen. I was with Richard and I did not go to the Monaco Grand Prix. I went into Monaco for one day and I visited the aquarium all by myself and it was totally mm -hmm. British. <laughs> I spent happy times at, at Villefranche. I loved it. Um, and we also uh, made a trip to Monton to see uh, where Catherine Mansfield had lived. Catherine Mansfield is a very famous New Zealand writer that we grew up studying her works and, and admiring her writing and it was it meant quite a lot to me to see the house that she had lived in towards the end of her life it's and we also went to the villa in Frizzy and um, enjoyed it and it was very very nice to see your, your photos Paul and bring back so many lovely memories thank you you're welcome okay any other comments, questions? We're early, we have time. No. Okay. So, as I said, for people who were here just before we started, we have some things in the chat. Let me have a look at that. Uh, somebody has put up Ingrid Schmucker Tours um, for you in the chat. And I think um, once you want to book with tours by locals, it's really a bit unethical to then go and book directly with the person and cancel your trip, which you can do. Uh, so we didn't. But uh, here you have uh, Ingrid Schmucker's uh, website, Best French Riviera Tours. So if anybody's going to that area, uh, if you can get this person, I would say that she is a very good guide um, and tries to take you to things that uh, are not the usual touristic stops, for example, and does things like say, we should go to Es 
before the tour buses arrive so you can just have it to yourself which we did which different from when I went there before I've been to Edge before but a lot of tourists when I was there before so things like this it's market market day in Valbon it's Friday we should go on that tour on Friday and we'll take you into the mountains and we didn't ask her to do anything she organized a picnic on her own and had it all sorted out that's where she was going to take us she just said okay guys we need to buy food because we're going to have lunch outside so let's go to a few of the places in the market and pick out what you would like and so we did so it was quite a wonderful experience and if you have four people it becomes fairly cost effective I can't believe that you walked from the Villa of Fruzzi to Bielsfrosh. I mean, for me, that seems like a very long walk. It was about an hour. And it was, a, it was a long walk. And we were getting a little bit weary of walking by the time we were getting there. But it was pleasant. And we got there in time for lunch. So it was okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it reminds me of the walk along Antibes. The coastline there is beautiful. And it's... Uh, the, the, the walkway is, is right over the rocks. It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm glad to see you walk so much. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we like to walk. And uh, the weather was favorable. And we said, why not? Let's let's try it and see how it goes. We took a cab back to Nice afterwards <laughs> from Villefranche. Okay. So thank you, and I'm going to let you know about the next meeting. It's going to be June the 13th, and uh, Peter Wing and Claire Weeks, uh, they're going to talk about their experience of visiting Morocco. And I think you'll find that in the uh, newsletter and also on the website, the Meritage website. And that will be our last uh, uh, session for the academic year we will break for july and august there'll be no sessions then and we'll start back again in september we haven't uh, organized speakers yet for september october or any of the months after the summer so we're looking for people who might be interested in talking uh, about their experiences uh, it doesn't have to be travel that was done just in the last few months or anything like that but uh, if you would be interested in talking, please uh, send me an email. We can chat about it and see what we can organize. And right now, just about any month is wide open. So let me know and we're happy to slot you in. I always like to try to have different speakers, not the same people talking all the time. So uh, let's get some other people to offer themselves up. Thank you very much, uh, and if uh, there are no other comments, I will um, close the meeting and have a good afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome.